succession planning, a blueprint for council succession. Um, I'm Mike Strachan, I'm the Vice President of Villages and Resort Villages and Northern Communities for SUMA. I'm also the Mayor of the Village of Torquay. Joining us today we have uh, Councillor Hilary Gough from the City of Saskatoon, Councillor Jordan McPhail from the Town of Larange, Rhonda Rosenberg, the Executive Director for, Mul for Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan, and Elena Young, who's a trustee with the Regina School Boards. For those of you with the SUMA Convention app, we're, we're doing something different this year where you'll be able to text questions through that app, so I suggest if you want to ask a question and you're a little afraid to come to the microphone and talk, please download the app and, and try it out. Next year we're not using the handbook and it'll be solely the app, so please try it out this year. So I want to uh, remind everybody in this room that there's lots of valuable information. Some of it may not pertain to your situation, but there will be a lot pertaining to your situation in your community. So please, if you have questions, uh, um, please come and ask them. Our, our panelists here will be more than happy to answer them. So as, as we start, I, I'll, I'll let our presenters introduce themselves and, and give, a, give a little bit of their background on this. So Jordan, go ahead. Hi, uh, name's Jordan McPhail, uh, 27 years old, up in the town of Larange, and I gotta say it's an honor to be uh, joining you guys here on Treaty 4 territory and homeland of the Métis. And uh, it was kind of funny, I had a very similar uh, response to the gentleman up in the front row here. I was putting the microphone on, he's like, aren't you a little young to be talking about succession planning? And uh, <laughs> when, uh, when Steve uh, contacted me and said, uh, hey Jordan, I'd like to you know, bring you in on this, on this panel, I thought, you ass, I plan on running again. You know, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, he he quickly told me that it was uh, it was in, to, to talk about you know and in, in bring diverse uh, uh, voices to the table, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion along uh, alongside these lovely people up here. And I like to thank Suma for the opportunity, and you for the opportunity to be able to sit and chat with you a little bit today. So, hopefully, we have a good discussion. Lena. Hi, and uh, my name is Alina Young. I'm a second term trustee here in Regina Public, and I'm also currently serving as the vice president of all of the school boards in Saskatchewan. Uh, again, it's my second term there, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be here, uh, not only to speak on this panel and uh, hopefully say some sane, coherent things, but I also love the SUMA convention, so uh, thank you for hosting me and allowing us uh, to sneak in and listen to uh, Paul Wells this morning. He's one of my favorite journalists, so uh, I'm already having a great day. Thanks. Hillary. Good morning, everybody. My name's Hillary Goff. I'm a first term counselor in Saskatoon. I represent Ward 2. And um, I'm also City Council's lead on community safety and well-being. I probably won't touch too much on um, the uh, kind of portfolio structure that our council has decided to adopt, but I will talk a little bit about that. And if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to chat about that later. Um, I had a bit of a similar reaction as Jordan when I was invited onto the panel. Um, but I do actually really actively think about succession. Uh, with my own role and in the ward that I represent and on our council and so I'm really eager to talk about that with you today. Rhonda? And I'm Rhonda Rosenberg. I'm the unelected person on this panel um, and I work for the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan known as MCUS and we um, I actually like Jordan I want to acknowledge that in Saskatchewan we're always on treaty land and today we are on Treaty 4 in the homeland of, of the Métis Nation um, home of the Nehewak people, the Anishinaabek, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people. Um, it's really important for all of us to keep in mind that we are there, are, there have always been a great diversity of cultures on this land. And that the more that our, my perspective on, on this topic is the more that our, any organization, including councils, reflect our communities the better decisions that we're going to make for all of the people. Thank you, Rhonda. So how, how are we going to work today is I have, a, I have three questions I'll ask, get you guys thinking about what you want to ask, and, and panelists, if you, if you want to answer, just, I guess, raise your hand. I guess we'll do a school thing, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you speak on it. So. Um, so here's the first question. Why is it important, with a view on succession planning, to embrace diversity and, and engage youth youth and was there a personal moment or experience that convinced you of this? Wow. Go ahead Elena. Alright, I'll be brave. Uh, so not only 
do I think that having more diverse representation in local government is important for the quality of decisions that are made and the representation on your various councils or in my case school boards. I also think that it is critically important to the survival of local government writ large. Um, and I'm coming at this, I, obviously I, I come from a different table, I sit at our local school board and as some of you know, uh, school boards have gone through a number of amalgamations over the past uh, few years and we've gone from having uh, thousands of people at our conventions to uh, around 200 and not only do I think that's problematic um, for having representation in a province as diverse uh, geographically, culturally, everything in Saskatchewan. Thank you, I'll speak louder. Uh, I also think if we believe in local government and we believe in having local voices represented in decision making, we need to have councils that look like the people whom we want to represent. Um, personally, I've been the youngest trustee uh, for the eight years that I've served, and I am not quite so young anymore. I'm now in my mid-30s, and I should not be the youngest person uh, sitting at every table, and I think, that's, uh, I think that's really problematic for us overall as uh, democratic institutions and governors. Thanks. Go ahead, Ron. Um, and I would add to what Alina said um, in saying that um, not only when we have um, decision-making leaders that reflect our communities, do we make better decisions? And I want to say, not easier or faster conversations. We need to acknowledge that. Um, but we also, more perspectives around the table bring greater creativity and innovation. And I think that that's something that we all want. When we're drawing from everybody's strengths and experiences and really seeing people for those strengths and not for deficits, that's when we're going to get innovation, creativity, and, and accessible service for everybody. And I think that that's what we want. Hillary? So um, I'm not the youngest member on my council which is a really exciting thing for me. Um, and I sit on a council that is more than 50% women. And that's the first time we've had that in our municipality. Um, and I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't always know what to credit for those statistics, but what I do know is that we are a major outlier. Um, it isn't to say that there aren't women or young people serving in this province, uh, but um, over the holidays, the uh, Leader Post and the Star Phoenix um, came together to do some reporting on governance and they reported that in um, villages 25% of elected uh, representatives are female, in resort villages it's 21, in towns it's 21, and in cities it's 20, and only six in rural municipalities. And so we know, we've, we've known that there is a representation gap for women particularly uh, for years. This is not new information and um, we certainly have not um, had a lack of consideration about what we might do about that, um, but it's really uh, not been something that has changed tremendously. And when you look at other sectors, it's not all that different. In the corporate sector, um, on corporate boards, the number uh, in Canada in 2016 was around 20%. So I'm driven by understanding that there is a gap and understanding that the gap is important in how we represent our communities. But it's interesting because from a personal perspective, I didn't see myself as being part of the solution to filling that gap until someone looked at me and said, we need more people like you representing our community. We need more of your voice. And it wasn't until somebody said that to me directly that I considered what my role might be in the issues that I knew were pervasive across all sectors in my community, your community, our province and our country. And so, um, Understanding those numbers is really important, but understanding what each of our roles is in closing that gap, I think is really important. And I'm really excited to discuss uh, what our roles is, are as elected leaders um, for doing that. Any comments, Jordan? Yeah, it's kind of a yes and conversation here. Um, yeah. But you know, one of the changing dynamics that I also see in smaller communities is uh, in the larger centers, you have a ward system and in smaller towns and villages you don't. So really if you are planning succession planning and planning on running again, 
ultimately you're trying to shoulder tap your competition and say you need to run too, which makes it a changing dynamic. Um, especially in this upcoming election where it's so close to a provincial election, the incumbent that if you plan on running again and you're shoulder tapping somebody, you're already a step ahead because you have name recognition for that four years going into it. So being a strong ally to somebody that's coming in was extremely, is extremely important. Um, and I know that you know, in, in our home community, uh, we had some uh, pride celebrations and that you talked about a personal moment um, where it was important. And I remember the, the first year that we had uh, our celebrations in, in the town of La Ronge, uh, we had a lot of young kids that were between 12, 13, uh, 15 years old um, that were having a lot of challenges in uh, talking about their sexuality and um, finding the leadership to talk to um, people within the community to try and bridge those gaps um, that, that might be in your community. Um, you know, some of the things like gender neutral washrooms, I'm not going to say Laurent is definitely there or on track to do that, um, but we, we've, we've made some significant gains because the people in that youth community that is diverse, and to me I'm only an ally to that community, but um, the, the honor that we have is we have the privilege to, to reach out to that. We can use what we have to amplify those voices. Um, and to me, that's where succession planning is an extremely important, is as we're having these conversations with um, people in the, in, in the diverse communities, uh, whether it be youth, you know, it's, it's funny when you talk about youth because if you're, if you're planning for your next election for a youth member to run and you want somebody that's 18, that means you have to shoulder tap a 14 year old in 2020. And no 14 year old I know, or when I was 14, I certainly wasn't involved in politics. But uh, a really good indicator is I went to a, um, a Churchill High School in, uh, in La Ronge and I went to a social studies class of uh, grade eights and grade nines and you hear them talk about current events and how that matters in their life. Um, and you can really see the leadership qualities amongst the youth. And trust me, as somebody that was uh, a member of the, the youth that did not care about politics until I turned about 21, and then getting involved in politics, and now sitting here and talking to some, a group of 200, uh, anxiety goes pretty high, and if you can get them at 14 and get them used to talking to crowds before they hit the adult stages, it's gonna be a lot easier for them. So getting the tools there before they are considering it, before they're trying to actively be a part of your politic, is extremely important. Thank you, Jordan. Next question. So how do you change from embracing diversity and engaging youth into creating opportunities for people to become the next leaders? Do you want me to start? Sure, uh, I, uh, I guess I can just touch a little bit more on that. Um, you know, getting involved in the schools. Um, another, another thing that you can do is uh, encourage some like youth council within your high mm -hmm. schools or elementary schools. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of paradox to say that, you know, just get involved um, because that's what we're consistently trying to do is get out there and do that. Um, I was having a conversation with uh, one of the guys at the hotel yesterday and I said that you're never going to take somebody that is a, a person that does not care about politics and convince them to run. It's not going to happen, especially between now and 2020. What you have to do is take somebody that doesn't care about politics to at least paying attention to politics. And the people that are paying attention about politics, get them to comment on it. And then people that are commenting on it, try and get them to find a solution for it. And the people that are finding solutions for it, get them to run for council. Because anybody in our community, as we all know, uh, knows how to find the problem. But not many people are willing to be a part of that solution. So the people that are already trying to be a part of that solution, trying to bring them into your council meetings, um, maybe throwing out some hypothetical issues um, that councils may face to try and get them going, um, is one of the most important things that I think you can do. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure, I'm going to play show and tell. <laughs> um, with SUMA's partnership a few years ago, we created a welcoming and inclusive communities toolkit. It's available for free download on our website. If anybody wants the address for it, just come see me right after this. And, and this gives you lots of tools about how to engage with people and, and where to go because one of the things that I really notice when um, organizations are, are looking to engage with ethnocultural communities or newcomers or indigenous communities that there's often an expectation that they're get, that you know an organization, a city can hold an event and that folks are going to come to that event. 
And one of the things that I would really say is you need to go to, and that's what Jordan was saying too, like you need to go where the folks that you want to engage with gather. And, and that, that would be one tip that's from here, but, but there's a whole, a whole cycle of, of planning and activity that, that's in here to really look at what diversity currently looks like and, and help you plan to, to go further. One thing that I think we've seen some success with in Saskatoon in terms of creating opportunities for leadership is having actual roles for leadership. And I understand that we're a very large municipality uh, in the context of this province, and so I don't expect that every municipality is going to have uh, you know, the, the capacity and opportunity to, to um, create these opportunities in such formal ways. But um, we actually, we have advisory committees who we look to to advise us on a variety of issues in our community, and we appoint members of our community to that. Um, now, how diverse and representative those committees are is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a result of the, the work we put into structuring that. And so um, we've actually just reformed those committees so that uh, our terms of reference are more, more consistent within those and that a diversity of representation is built into the terms of reference of those committees. And what that forces us to do is to say, we have not succeeded in recruiting Métis representation onto this committee. That doesn't mean we simply fill the seat with someone else. It means we actually have to go out and do the work. Um, and I, I attended a, a panel session um, on uh, board diversity not too long ago um, as part of some education. And one of the panelists said to me, or said to the crowd, um, if you're unable to find a young person to sit on your board, you simply haven't tried hard enough. Um, it isn't that there aren't people who want to be part of community work. They may not know what the terms are for it. They may not know, have seen your opportunity. And it's actually our job to go and make sure that people understand the opportunities that exist in our communities and that we're creating those opportunities in a way that, um, that make them feel welcome to come and be a part of it. And sometimes that welcoming environment requires one-on-one -on -one work. Uh, so it may require a different type of support than uh, recruiting generally for uh, the various opportunities we have. And so on, uh, on our committees, we've dictated that there will be at least one youth representative on every committee. And we had extensive debate in council chambers about what that should or shouldn't look like. And there were a number of members who said, we can't just have one youth member because now you're throwing one youth member onto a committee with folks who may all be 30 years their senior and how are we expecting them to participate fully in this without additional support, we need to have two members. So we started batting around, of, around the idea of two members and what we ended up coming back to was, we can have one member, great if we have two, and youth are certainly welcome to, to apply in other positions on committees, but we actually need to dedicate another member of the committee, either the chair of the committee, the vice chair of the committee, to partner with the youth member to orient them to how the committee works, to what their role is there, and to making sure that they feel comfortable asking questions either within the setting or between and outside of meetings to be able to participate. Now I understand that uh, you know, a committee structure isn't necessarily going to be the tool that might make sense for your community, but doing those extra steps to make sure that diverse members of our community um, have the opportunity to participate meaningfully is I think the, the message that I'm trying to share in, in some of that work. And um, sometimes it means a bit of extra time by those of us who are more comfortable in those settings, and it might mean um, by our elected representatives. So I think it's really important that we create uh, spaces that are welcoming, um, but that we also go and actively welcome people into those spaces and then support them when they're there. Thank you, Heather. Elaine? Yeah, I think I'll add on that um, a little bit, and I think something we need to consider is also the existing culture in the organizations. Um, that we represent. So in my school division, we have uh, just shy of 3,000 staff, and if we're looking at, say, teachers, 60% of our teaching force, depending on whether you're elementary or high school, but in some schools up to 80% is female. And then if you get to the vice principal level, it gets closer to 50-50. If you get to the principal level, all of a sudden you start to have more men in those roles. If we get up to the supervisor level, then it's 80-20. Superintendents, 80-20. And if you look at directors of education around the province, there are, I think, three out of 27 who are currently women. Um, 
And so when I sit around my table and I look at that, that doesn't feel right to me. Um, and I'm, I'm a person with a lot of privilege. Um, you know, I'm a, a middle class white lady who's gone to university and is really comfortable sitting around those type of tables and having frank discussions. But if we don't have women uh, in my organization seeing an ability to move up and seeing uh, a future in leadership roles, for me, that's really problematic. And the answer to the question isn't just like, well, I guess we don't have any women who are applying to be high school principals or who are applying to be superintendents or directors. Um, to me, that's not a good answer and really um, indicates that there is some really active and dedicated thinking and actions that need to be taken. Now, I, I, know, how, uh, I know how our various pieces of legislation work. I know you can't necessarily mandate you know, uh, that you have to have 50% women on uh, your council. The, Election acts don't allow for that. However, like just looking at gender in Saskatchewan, I think we're at what 50, 52 percent, and we're one of the provinces uh, with a little, a little bit less women than some of the other ones. But every single council here should theoretically be 50-50 female male, and we're not. Um, and so, actively making that space for people and having those conversations and meeting people where they are, um, and shoulder tapping people who aren't represented is so important and I cannot stress that enough. And also once they get there, I'm just picking up on the pieces in terms of actively doing the work to mentor people um, is so, so critical because uh, they can be really intimidating environments. Um, so I know like personally, I've been meeting with dozens of people dozens of times over the past year because I'm not running again to actively try and make them comfortable and get them onto parent councils and get them coming out to our school board meetings and like, you know, all that, there's no stupid questions, ask us anything about anything. Being accessible and accountable to the communities that you represent and that you want represented is so important and I can't stress that enough. Thanks, Lynn. Rhonda? I wanted to, um, I guess, reinforce that idea of how important equity is and how important it is that we need to actually look at what the barriers are and how we can actively reduce them. I also wanted to mention a program that we have that is not super spread out around the province, but if you want more information about it, I'm happy to talk about it. It's called Involve, and it's about, it's, it stands for Integrating New Volunteers with Opportunities for, to Add Leadership Value Through Education. And it's really about both helping organizations nonprofit organizations, but also elected organizations like councils and, and school boards to be ready to welcome diversity and preparing volunteers to actually understand what it means to be a, a leadership volunteer on a board or a committee, um, understand what that means in Saskatchewan, understand, share ideas about what leadership and volunteering mean from different cultural perspectives. Um, and. Um, and then have that mentorship opportunity. Be, um, that, and I think it's really important, whether it's like a one-on-one -on -one buddy system or it's uh, you know, a whole board or council ready to, to mentor some new folks coming on, that, um, that is really key for, for all of us to not just have maybe somebody who comes on and kind of says, well, that was a kind of scary one term and I didn't talk a lot and, and I don't think I'm going to run again. To somebody who feels really supported in their growth on, on, on council or a committee or whatever they choose to be involved on. And, and I think that there are lots of opportunities there that, um, that you really can intentionally take advantage of. Jordan? Yeah, I was going to add on that. I know I already answered the question, but now that we've had this discussion, a couple more things have come up. But um, I know that as a, as a youth person, I was involved in like the federal and provincial uh, parties and going into like federal and provincial elections. I was well versed on the going door to door, talking to people, that part I was comfortable with. Um, getting around a council table was completely different. Um, I'm sure that anyone in their first term, which I, I think everybody in our council was, and uh, if any of you are out there, thank you for being so supportive. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, going into the uh, going into the first couple meetings, um, I, I think a really important thing is if you're trying to prime somebody for council, once they're there, it's kind of trial by fire. 
um, they're going to have to learn by hitting their, you know, hitting the ground running. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, supports that you can be an ally to, to say like, hey, you know, thank you for speaking up. I know we disagreed on that point, but thank you for speaking up. That's important. Um, but ultimately, if you're trying to prime somebody for that type of position, um, getting them into the right type of thought processes. I know a lot of times that I've been to a council meeting, I thought there is no way you read the you read the brief from administration and you go, I'm going to have a few questions about that. That it seems a little ridiculous. You get the you get the explanation and then you understand why you're doing what you're doing. And I think having that conversation with people within your community, youth or diverse candidates that you're trying to shoulder tap to get into there, it's, it's, uh, it's important to uh, allow them to sit and instead of just trying to uh, debate right away as if you are, are in a council meeting, that you try and work with people to say like, hey, let's work through this thought together and you, you talk about the issues because you're going to learn something from that as an elected leader to understand the community that you're trying to you know, shoulder tap as well as they're going to understand how their role is going to be important at the council table and they're going to get used to that ebb and flow of the conversation. I, I just, something to up what Jordan said and something I wanted to say, if you're sitting around a council table right now and you're like, oh gee, this isn't the most diverse group or you're sitting in this room being like, hey, I'm a 60 something year old white guy, what do, what do, what do I do? Uh, shit, I feel like I'm the person who everybody's against right now when we're talking about diversity and stuff like that. There are some really simple things that everybody can do to make people feel more welcome and included uh, sitting around board tables. If you're sitting around a table, pay attention to who's speaking. Mm -hmm. It's something as simple as that or who's being interrupted. Um, pay attention to how your peers treat other people. Uh, like a terrible anecdote, I am currently the vice president of all school boards. And I have somebody who habitually calls me babe. Right? <laughs> habitually, in, in a professional context, not out for beers afterwards, in my role. And our president is a pretty rough and tumble uh, rancher and farmer from the Southwest. And like, you can bet nobody is calling him babe sitting around the same table <laughs> and uh, although maybe I should um, but <laughs> uh, it didn't stop even though I'd said hey you know my name is Alina uh, until unfortunately an older rough and tumble rancher who's also a trustee said something and that's it, it's unfortunate that that is the case but that was important to me being taken seriously and that was obviously important to me because it was driving me bonkers. Um, but there are really simple things that you can do to pay attention, uh, like paying attention to how people around you are being treated. Who's sitting silently at your table and actively saying, hey, what do you think about this? Or making sure that the people who might not be as widely represented, whether they're women, whether they're newcomers, whether they're visible minorities, whether they're indigenous folks, whoever that person is in a position of perhaps uh, a little bit of difference, actively making space for them in a discussion is so important. And I, I, like that is a really easy thing everybody here can do um, going forward at your council table. And also I think just even, you know, coffee, real, real life. See who's sitting there quietly and bring them into the conversation. So my last question before we open the floor is, what role does leadership have in developing a blueprint for succession, and what supports have you found available? Whoa. Do you want me to start? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about this one. Um, well, one thing I, I wanted to mention before we get into the formal blueprint is just to, to talk a little bit about how we talk about our own roles. Um, first of all, I think leadership and elected leaders have a huge role to play in the succession on our own councils. We definitely have to acknowledge that we are operating in a democratic system and we do not get to pick and choose our successors or our colleagues. But people look to us to understand how the process works and they look to us to understand what the dynamics at a present council table are and in a present municipality are and often won't know anything about that process or that role unless we're talking to them about it. And so especially in smaller communities, it's really important to think hard about um, how we're talking about our roles, how we're talking about ourselves in our roles and who we're talking about those things with. Um, and 
one of the things that I think is tremendously valuable in a role of leadership is just a little bit of vulnerability. It takes a little bit of vulnerability to be willing to tell a stranger, yeah, I'm thinking about not running next time around. There's going to be vacancy on our council. That takes vulnerability. It takes vulnerability to say, yeah, I don't always know precisely how I'm going to vote when I go in on an issue or precisely, you know, that I fully understand something and I really appreciate when my colleagues bounce ideas off of me before, during and after meetings so that we can all come to an understanding together. Yeah, sometimes in this role it's challenging in this, that and the other way, but you know what's really rewarding are these things here. Hey, when I started, I didn't know the first thing about door knocking. That was super intimidating. Here's how I learned about it. Would you like to come along with me next campaign? Those are all vulnerable things to say to somebody, and in particular to say to somebody who we don't already have a close and trusting relationship with. But if we are only shoulder tapping people who look like us, people who we are already familiar with, people who, we can, al who can already picture themselves in the role, we aren't going to make progress on, the, on having our councils reflect the folks that we're representing. And so I think the way in which we engage in those conversations is so important. And we're often really used to making sure that we're representing our organizations in a really professional manner. And that is so important. And there are many, many spaces where that needs to be a real priority. But there are lots of opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and even in groups, where we reflect some of the vulnerability that people are going to feel before they need to be able to feel and understand before they can picture themselves making what's going to feel like a bit of a nutty step to do something like put themselves their names forward for an elected position. So I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that I think is our job as leaders is to think about what the barriers we might have faced in our roles are or are facing in our roles and figure out how we can knock them down before the next people have to come in and do it instead. And so I think that we absolutely and quite obviously and are only the only people who can take leadership on policy. So look at what your council policies are and try to figure out if they would support somebody uh, in your community who isn't sitting around the table. And what's really important to remember about the tools that we can put in place is they will benefit everybody. It will benefit our community as a whole and it will benefit us. It's really hard to make decisions that benefit us in our roles. I understand that. It's not fun. Uh, you probably all had discussions about what to do when the federal government decided about the taxable uh, portions of our salaries, and nobody liked having those discussions. But we have to make tough decisions in our, in our roles, and no one, can, no one else can make them for us. So one thing that I want everybody to be aware of is that in the amendments to the Cities Act that are coming forward, there will be a change that uh, gives us the opportunities in our communities to proactively make policy that would um, define certain, uh, proactively define the opportunities for people to take leave from these positions. At present, the Cities Act says that if someone misses three meetings in a row, they're off council unless there's a resolution by us. Often that's in public and often that's in a time of pretty major change or crisis for somebody. And that's not a very welcoming way in which to negotiate how you're going to be supported in your job. And so if we can proactively make policy that says that during a time of bereavement, of critical illness, of uh, family parental changes, someone is automatically um, uh, able to take a leave from council without losing their position. Of course, there will be other stipulations attached to that. But if we can proactively create the setting where there is some flexibility in the role, then <coughs> folks won't need to come in and jump over those barriers one by one after they've decided to come to join us. Or they won't look at the job and say, that isn't going to provide me the flexibility that I need. Or there's too much unpredictability in the health status of my parents or you know, the wellness of people around me or myself to be able to take this step. Um, and re realistically, people can't see those things coming and our lives are really unpredictable and all of us don't know when the next time we're gonna need a bit of support from our colleagues is. But if we're expecting people to come in a public venue to a council table and ask us for a resolution to not, be, uh, not lose their position on our council tables for something that is 
something we should be expecting in our population, on our councils, and in our lives, then that puts them, uh, that puts us all at a disadvantage, and it's something that we wouldn't expect in other workplaces. So um, I don't think we should be expecting that sort of vulnerability on our elected, in our elected spaces. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and say something else um, that I don't think is necessarily directly related to, say, diverse representation on a council that I think is really important in the long term um, is also authenticity and transparency. Um, I, I started out at the top by talking about how I think having um, representation and diversity in local government is really important for the survival of local government overall. And I think this ties in. Um, we all sit around tables and we all sit through very long meetings uh, and sometimes they can be boring, sometimes they can be inaccessible to people who might not necessarily be uh, in those rooms or at those tables, but we all also know how critical that work is to the communities that we represent. And not doing very simple things, and I realize I'm saying this as a person who said shit at SUMA on a panel, now twice, <laughs> uh, is I think, re being a, accountable and also being transparent and authentic as local governors is so important for people to be able to look and be like, oh, those are humans and those are people who can be vulnerable, who are comfortable having conversations in public, whether they're uh, collaborative or perhaps a little bit more heated. I think that is so important, um, not just to good governance, but also to our communities. Like our peers and the people who elect us should be able to watch our meetings and understand what's going on. And that accountability and transparency piece goes so much uh, so much further than just, you know, like having your salaries, your travel expenses uh, posted, or, you know, having your audited financial statements or, or all of that. I think being more comfortable, having more conversation in the public portions of our meetings, and just having them with, you know, people who ask you questions at the grocery store is really important and, again, a really simple way uh, to make local elected office more accessible to people who might find it a little bit more intimidating. Rhonda? Yeah, and I, I think, I think that a huge part of what I'm hearing is about relationships and, and that we need to, that this is really about expanding who we're thinking about having those relationships with. Because if we don't have a relationship with someone, we don't have that groundwork to have difficult conversations with problem-solving conversations with, planning for the future conversations with, conversations about our policy, right? All of those things are about building those relationships, thinking about who's at the table, who's not at the table, who do I need to reach out to, who, who can I possibly, you know, think about that, that connect with? Like what, what event, what of the gazillion events that I go to to bring greetings, how can I actually connect with people at those and not leave as soon as I've brought the greetings? Because um, we've seen that. <laughs> but I also see politicians who stay and talk to folks. And I have seen a group of newcomers be astounded by a provincial politician who chose to stick around and really listen to them. And they were like, in my country, this would never, ever happen. He would come in with bodyguards and be completely inaccessible. And I think with local government, especially you guys are the most accessible. And, and really to continue to make yourselves that and reach out to people and build those relationships that can grow into all different kinds of things. It might be about election, it might be about feeding the information in order to understand why a certain policy or decision might need to go in that direction or a different direction. So, so for me, that's really about the, the very biggest key to, to reflect, to having councils that reflect diversity of communities is about building relationships first in order to then build even better relationships in the future. Thank you. Jordan? Uh, so I'll touch a little bit on the uh, the youth side about uh, attracting youth to council. Um, so if you're if you have a pen and paper, I've got the sections under your acts of which you can actually appoint a youth council member, somebody that is under the age of 18, that can sit on your council in an advocacy role. They do not count co towards quorum. 
Um, they cannot sit in the in-camera sessions, but they have the opportunity to speak on every single matter that is before council. So it's like having another voice at the table, and it's the quick and fast way outside of an election that you can get that direct <coughs> influence on your council tables. So under the Northern Municipalities Act, if you're in the Northern Administrative District, it's under Section 102. Uh, you can read it up and see what the terms are in that to see what you can do. Uh, in the Municipalities Act, it's Section 82.1. And in the Cities Act, it's Section 56.1. So uh, in those situations, you do not need an election to get youth at your council table. I'll repeat, you do not need an election to get youth at your council table. Um, <laughs> Secondly, uh, I had also talking to the same gentleman at the, uh, at the hotel there yesterday. He had said that he had never heard of the MLDP. That course is absolutely phenomenal for anyone that is in council. And I don't know if you are able to get that course to people that are wanting to come into a council uh, discussion, um, if you can. Maybe holding like a, you know, once a month you have these, this MLDP course hosted in your community. Uh, inviting surrounding communities, maybe it can be a regional partnership where you bring a bunch of communities together to get that same thing going. And you have people that are actively getting involved in getting the tools that they're going to need the second that they get elected to start uh, being involved in that process. Um, and the, the last major thing that uh, is an asset to anyone considering running council is yourself. Uh, whether you're an administrator or a counselor, you are the person that has put their name forward for nomination, followed the process legally, got there, got your names, got your, went out and did your door knocking, got your signs ready, fundraised in some cases. Uh, you're, you've sat at the table, you've had the discussions, you've had disagreements, you've had debates, you've won, you've lost, you've had the full experience of that. And you know, I, I kind of have this conversation of don't go out and try and get your whole council to be youth. Um, because you know it's kind of like the Edmonton Oilers. If you have too many rookies, you're not going to win the cup. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and if you have too many veterans, you're going to end up like the San Jose Sharks and also not win the cup. You kind of have to be like the Washington Capitals and be right in the middle, right? So um, to me, that's you know that's where it's important to shoulder tap people that don't necessarily agree with you. Even um, you you need to find people that are diverse. Um, and, and like I said, every conversation that you have with somebody that isn't like yourself, you're going to learn something, which is going to make you a stronger leader, and every conversation you have with them is going to make them a stronger leader, because they understand where you're coming from, and you have a pl place of understanding with them. And that's the most important thing, is being open-minded enough to be able to accept that you are going to have a dis difference of opinion, and you can agree to disagree, as we all have on council ch in our council chambers. Thank you. Now it's your turn. Um, we're open for questions. Please remember to state your name, community, ask your question as this is being recorded. So, go ahead, sir. Hi, Kurt Turner, Village of Beachy. Um, I'm here because I saw succession planning on the, uh, on the title. If I could just have a show of hands of people from villages and hamlets. Okay, I would say that's probably over 50% compared to uh, towns and, and cities. So when it comes to succession planning, um, and, and this is a two-part, uh, we only have one that is considering running again. I've been, to use your words, shoulder tapping uh, younger generation than myself. Um, and what's happening is they're all telling me they're too busy. Well, if they maybe hadn't bought all the land in the country <laughs> and all those other people have moved away now, you know, maybe there would be a hockey team in your hometown and you wouldn't be on the road driving all the time to take your kid or kids to hockey. The other thing that, uh, and I tried to bring on a youth onto our council. I was the only one that voted for it, and I got that idea at mayor's school. All the people that I've talked to, as I say, they say that they're too busy. Well, my generation, and more so the generation of my parents, they built churches, they built halls, they built schools, they raised bigger families than anybody's raising today, and they 
they have the time to do it. But I'm sorry to say that the people that aren't gray hair that I talk to, they're not the least bit interested in running for council. The other thing, uh, the other part of that goes to um, uh, the fact that anybody that I went and talked to, I didn't care what their gender was. I didn't care if they had a university education. What I cared about, were they honest? Were they concerned about the community? Would they work for, to, for the betterment of the community? I know when I started on council, I gave my fiduciary duty to that town. Thanks. Comments? Jordan. Well, uh, oh, it's on. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, what I can say is in regards to uh, youth being busy, uh, I think back to my grandpa. I also sit on council with my grandpa. And uh, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I have to bring up is the fact that in the economic times of my grandpa, there was one person that went out and worked and one person was able to stay home. So for me, as a young person growing up in the current economy, uh, both me and my partner have to work. And if we have kids and raise those kids, we both are still working and applying to the normal things of taking the kids to hockey, trying to volunteer to build churches and schools and all those kinds of things. Um, which to me uh, means that we need to do something to alleviate uh, the, the residents. As we all know, affordability is a huge issue in every single one of our municipalities and trying to find uh, places to, to make up those downfalls is, is huge. Um, and secondly, the only thing I can say is uh, we're politicians. We're really good at selling things to people. Um, and I, I remember when I was having conversations with some people that are around about my age about running in the, uh, in the next uh, election, they said, you know, I'm just way too busy. And I said, you know what, the funny thing is, is I was talking to somebody that, you know, like you said, maybe when I'm 40 and the kids are grown up, and maybe I'll run then. And I said, you know what, the funny thing is, is I was talking to somebody who's 40, and they said, you know what, if you would have talked to me when I was 20, I would have so been on this. So, you, I mean, use that argument. I mean, I mean it. For me, that was, that was the, one of the main arguments that got me involved was like, you know what, I'm involved in uh, the provincial party for the youth wing there, I'm involved in the federal party in the youth wing, and I, I don't have the time for it. And somebody's like, you got lots of time, you don't have, you don't have enough kids yet. Um, and I, I used the, that same argument, was it worked on me, and I'm here. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I, thank you, Jordan, for you know, some of that kind of history lesson, right? Because I think it's so important that we understand the, how, how the realities in all of our communities have changed. So then what I would encourage you to do is think about how has the role of an elected person in your community changed? And have the supports to do that role changed in that time as well? Because if they haven't, but everybody's economic and social reality has changed, then there's probably a bit of a disconnect there. And I'm not suggesting that a little bit more remuneration is going to make all the difference, but the small changes that we can make in terms of the, how the job is actually supported can make a difference. And so I would encourage you to talk to the people that you're out shoulder tapping. And Kurt, I love the examples that you shared about you know working to get a youth member on your council, and I'm sorry it wasn't successful, but it's heartening to hear about all of the efforts that are being made. Um, but asking the specifics beyond busy, because busy is a blanket term for a lot of things. And it might mean I can't take the time off work to attend a council meeting. It might mean I'm driving my kids to practice at those times and those times don't work for me. Um, and there are things we can do within our structures to reduce some of those barriers for people. And if we're hearing consistently that the barriers for the people we're trying to recruit onto our councils are the time of day of the meeting, maybe we need to think about the time of the day of the meeting changing. And I can't tell you what that might look like in your community, um, but those are conversations that, that evolve over time. And I think the role needs to evolve over time how the role looks and what the supports for the role need to evolve over time if who is going to be doing the role is also evolving over time. So I don't have any specific answers, but I think digging deeper into the no's 
will help to understand the, the small and big things we might be able to do internally to get to more yeses when we're out recruiting. Good, thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Just to oh, follow sorry. up on that, I appreciate where you're coming from. I think it would probably help you a lot more if you talk to people from hamlets and villages that like 300 people, 80 people, and you, you'll find what the challenges are. Because we're facing the fact that I believe, and I'm not exactly sure how the rules work, but we went through it at, at mayor school. If nobody runs, Suma has to come in, do a town hall meeting, and they appoint the people no. that are going to run. And, and, and that's why the succession planning is tremendously um, beneficial. And my parents live in the smallest resort village in the province. And I know every person who sits on that council and have over the last many years. Um, and, and it is part of an issue of who is living in our communities. If we don't, if our communities aren't attracting a younger and diverse um, you know, population and maintaining that population, it's going to be very hard to recruit a diverse representation on our councils, absolutely. And, and I think that goes beyond, um, you know, we're kind of pushing a little bit beyond the, the, maybe the scope of, of some of what, you know, some of us were recruited to, uh, to speak on this panel about, and I, and I don't want to presume to understand all of the complexities of that. Um, what I can say is when we're recruiting and we're not getting the answers we want, we have to understand the answers we're getting more deeply in order to figure out if there's another answer possible. Um, and I don't know what that looks like in your community, but I, I truly hope that there are people who have enough passion for their community like you do to be able to have a, to be willing to have a deeper conversation about what that opportunity could look like for them. Thank you, Hillary. Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca Otitoju. I'm a counselor from the town of White City. And um, I want to say, uh, listening to the four of you, one thing that came to my mind is we need individual mind, mind shift individually. And we also need to know that um, as individuals, we also have um, our concept of where we are and how we think we belong. So I'll, I'll use my two personal experiences to explain, to explain this to you. Um, when my family moved to Canada in the 90s, I worked with a bank uh, when call centers uh, were new. And uh, at the time, I think maybe till now, but for the period of years I was there, your supervisor would key in into your call and actually uh, listen to a call, uh, would mark and at times call you. So at that time, we were given an option, um, should I let you know I'm keying into your call? I said no because I should be acting the same way whether you are listening to me or whether you are not. So I, when you tell me you are going to listen, you are actually making me nervous. Mm -hmm. So I said no. So one day, um, somebody called from my original home country, uh, happened to be the same language, and uh, within a minute, this person recognized um, my accent, my uh, voice, and said, oh, you must be from here and you must be from this tribe. I said, yes, oh, okay, I recognize the same thing. And we switched from speaking English to uh, my language, our language. And it happened to be the time that a supervisor was listening to a call. So after the call, he came to me and said, Rebecca, I just gave you 100% on that call. I said, which call? <laughs> the one you just um, finished with a customer. I said, so what part of you did you, did you hear? <coughs> because I was actually speaking in my language to that person. And his comment was the fact that, yes, I did not hear anything except for the, your uh, introduction when the customer came in and the name exchange and then the switch. But I knew the customer was happy that um, he could speak his language. And even in that conversation, you were still able to transact whatever he wanted and you were able to give him uh, information. Okay. So that was an experience that, that stayed with me. And if we go around, I said in the 90s, I could maybe count on my two hands how, how many people were around like me. But today, when you go to schools, when you go around the community, we, we have uh, many. 
And then the second uh, experience that I had lately that I'm actually th I, I'm thinking about um, talking to that person about was another f a friend who came to me working in an organization and said, oh, you know, I just got a promotion. I said, that's good. Thank God we must be doing well. He said, yes, but you know, what happened was in this particular department, they were all women. And my supervisor just called me and said, oh, I need you there to supervise those women. This was a guy and a young person. I said, OK. But at the time he was talking to me, I didn't have enough time to talk. But for me, that person, as young as he is, is now being told, when we have women in a department, we need a man to be the supervisor. He saw that as a promotion. Interestingly, when I saw this um, uh, workshop, I thought I would come. Because last week, I was actually mentioning this to my husband that, you know, I need to call this person to see, you know, that statement is wrong. If you are promoted because you, you are promoted in, in a way, not because, oh, they are all women in that department, so I need you to supervise them. That is a wrong information that is being passed on uh, to you because I do not want you to grow up with that mindset. I, I, I have the right to say that to that person because of the relationship I, I have with him. So, and that's why I said, you know, individuals, the way you think, the way you see things, it, um, there was a day that I challenged because as um, Rhonda was talking about newcomers, when we come to a new country, the first thing for me is how to put food on my table for my family, how to get a job. I still think about when I work three jobs. So if you tell me to do something at that time, maybe I'll say no, thank you. But I, I remembered when we moved into White City, when I told my husband one day I want to sit on council. That was my personal decision because I, I got to a point knowing that this is where I am today and I'm part of this community and I need to also give back to the community. Not sit and say, oh, okay, 100 years or 50 years to come when I go back to my home original country, I will be useful there. No, this is where I am. So individually and as uh, some of you mentioned, as you shoulder tap people to encourage them, we also need to look among those newcomers and try to encourage them. Because many of us, are, as Rhonda said, I, I work at government house. In my country, government house is not a public place. Yeah. Your father has to be a governor or your brother a governor for you to go in there. It took me years to know that you can go to government house and, um, and see the museum is a place, is a public place. So many came with that mentality. And until we orientate them and until we let them know that, you know, this is what it is, you, you have the opportunity, make use of it. Thank you, Rebecca. Stephanie Monroe, uh, Just a second, Jordan, Jordan oh. would like to comment. Oh, sorry. I just comment. wanted to say thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing your story. Um, you, you know, you, you had said that in the, uh, in the phone conversation, speaking your own language was huge. Coming from a northern community, I can tell you that I, I, I might be, I'm, I'm assuming, but I'm thinking I'm going to be correct in this, that uh, everybody around our council table in La Ronge does not speak Cree. Mm -hmm. And we have an, uh, a community of almost the same population right next door um, that lives, works in our community as well, um, that speak uh, a lot of the indigenous languages in our area. And I think that it's important that uh, when we are looking to diversify what we're uh, uh, doing on our council, there's a lot of elders that have, that's their first, their first language. My mom is a nurse at the, uh, at the LaRange Hospital. And when we get elders coming into the hospital and you, know, you can imagine people are poking you with needles, putting bags up, uh, prescribing medication, speaking to you in English, uh, and you have no idea what they're saying. And you have one nurse that walks in and speaks in Cree, um, the, the relief that is there is huge. And that's what I mean is that, that that level of understanding between you and your community members needs to be there and you have to look at the gaps that you're, you're finding. And that's on, another point that I wanted to bring up is it's not so much looking at our councils as being reflective of the community we serve, but reflective of the community that we want to. And if, uh, if there's people that are newcomers coming to your community and there might only be a small family of, you know, 5, 10, 20, 15 people in, in the area, 
getting that person and that group to say, hey, what brought you to our community? Uh, what keeps you in our community? What can we do to um, in, entice more people to come to our community from your, uh, your, your section of diversity? Um, and, and you get them onto that council table, you start to break down the barriers and that'll also attract more people. So thank you for sharing your story. It's, it's, I think it's amazing for everyone to hear what you've uh, experienced going into a council. Thanks, George. So I just want to say I appreciate everything that you guys have said. I think it's all very valuable points of view. I think for Lloydminster, we have a very diverse council, although six are Caucasian males. However, <coughs> diversity for me looks a lot different, I think, than what it looks for a lot of people. I don't want to be around that table because I'm a Métis woman. I want to be around that table because I'm passionate about our community and because I've earned that spot on my community. So, should I run for council next time and I don't get elected and it's seven males around that table, I hope that our community pick the best seven individuals for our city. So, I, I I want to say that I want to have more women on council, that's amazing. If those are the right people that are needing to be there, if those are the people that have the passion, if those are the people that, so for me, diversity, my back end is in healthcare. We have people on our council that are from education, from business people, we have accountants. We, we have people that come from a vast array, array of backgrounds and to me, that's diversity as well, mm -hmm. right? So sure. I think that you can look at your sexual whether you're male, female, or whatever you identify as, I think you can identify as age as a demographic, but really the diversity comes from who you are and your passion for the community. But I, like I said, I completely agree, and that's wonderful that Saskatoon has 50% of councillors are women, but I hope that those 50% are there because they earn those spots, not just because of their sex. So. And I think it's really important to understand none of us were uncontested. Right, uh, no, abs absolutely. And, and, and I appreciate that. And I think what, what I think the idea about being proactive about diversity is to make sure that we understand that our structures and the culture in our communities means that people see themselves as excluded before they even get to the start line. And so we need to make sure that that's not the case in our community. Absolutely. And when we're talking about recruiting and succession planning, being excluded before you get to the start line can be as simple as not even knowing that the position exists, not even knowing that you would be uh, technically eligible to put your name forward. Um, in the case of newcomers, not understanding the distinction between permanent resident and citizen when you become eligible to vote or to run. Um, these are the barriers that people with diverse backgrounds may face before they ever consider stepping into the arena. And the other is the, the more insidious kind of culture of not seeing yourself in a space because you're not reflected there or because you haven't been encouraged to see yourself in that space and not considering yourself eligible just kind of more generally. And so it's not about saying we need to uh, elect people to councils. First of all, we don't elect people. Um, that's not our jobs. We each have one vote in our communities, nothing more, nothing less. And so it's about making sure that people can see themselves and understand the process to do the same thing we did in putting our names forward to be in the pool of candidates because we know that the pool of candidates is also not equal. And so we need to make sure our community sees women in leadership in all sorts of spaces, sees diversity in leadership in all sorts of spaces so that we don't have these underlying mental blocks to seeing that type of leadership. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name already, but you talked about leadership being a, you know, uh, somebody being appointed to a leadership position um, de facto because of their gender. We need to break down those stereotypes. And if we don't invite people to be part of the competition, they will absolutely never get elected. And if we don't invite themselves to, be see, to see themselves as part of the competition, then they will not get elected. And so absolutely, we need to elect the best representation we can have for our communities. But if we don't do something proactive, that will, not naturally, but de facto, be mostly white and male. And that's what we know about our society as it is constructed. And this is, a, this is an issue of deep history that we have a role in correcting. And it isn't to say that we're going to elect people who aren't qualified for the job or best qualified for the job, but that it takes work to make sure that those who are qualified 
and represent our community through their lived experience as well. It isn't just our training that makes us great counselors. It's what we ex are exposed to in our community by nature of who we are and how we interact in our community. We need that diversity at our table as well. And we actually have to be proactive in making sure that that's an opportunity. Thank you, Hillary. Elena? I, I think Hillary mostly covered it off, but I, I, I guess like, yes, nobody wants appointed people who aren't suitable for the job, but when you see but sometimes when I hear that, to me it sounds like, well then there are no qualified women, which we know isn't the case. There are no qualified Métis people, which we know isn't the case. Like Regina Public, to my knowledge, has never had an Indigenous trustee. Okay. And the requirements are 18 Canadian citizen, and you send your education property tax to the public system, not the Catholic. That's it, and I don't for a second believe that that means we don't have qualified people in the city. Um, and, and it's getting those people to the table or, or saying, why aren't the, how, how are we not meeting these people where they are? How are we not making this more welcoming? That, that is the challenge. And I guess my point of view is just more that diversity looks different than just your sex or yep. your color of your skin, right? Yeah, for sure. Diversity is your background. Yeah. For, like, from my personal yeah. point of view, and I guess I'm just yeah. yeah, I agree completely with everything that I'm saying. It's just that I just wanted to bring up that point of view is that my spot at that table, like I said, is not because I'm a female and maybe I hope that my spot at that table is because of who I am and what I bring to that And I might add, I think it's really important that when we have diversity in various spaces that we aren't calling on people who bring a diversity that we don't have only for that experience. Yeah. So I hope genuinely and I know and I believe that my colleagues turn to me for all sorts of things that I bring to the table. Yes, because I'm young. Yes, because I'm a woman. But also because I have experience in the nonprofit sector. Also because I am, you know, deeply passionate and knowledgeable about community safety and well-being. And therefore, it, when, when we're looking, and because I speak French, and so they call on me to do that. Nobody knew that when they were electing me, right? We, we turn to the people around our table to be better as a collective in making decisions, and we need to make sure that when we support diversity at our tables, that we're drawing on people for all of the diversity that they bring to our tables, and that we're identifying all sorts of gaps in our diversity. And, and when we elect to, to boards, when we appoint to boards, we do a diversity matrix to figure out what are we missing. We don't do that on our councils because we aren't appointing people. But I think we need to think of ourselves in that way and say, okay, what perspectives does this council not have? And if we can't get it elected, where else can we find it in our community? Because our community has it. Rhonda, did you want to make this? Uh, and I think, I think everybody's talked about this. I'm just going to use the word tokenism, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not good for anybody. Right? We don't want, we don't want to, nobody feels good when they're kind of the token whatever, Métis woman on, on, on any kind of organization because then we start to look at those folks as if they don't really deserve to be there and questioning that, right? That, that's that, that question mark hanging over people. I went to did some work with a police college class that was all it was like the equity class. <laughs> and I thought, these folks are going to graduate from police college and always have that question mark over their heads, that they're always going to have to prove that they actually deserve to be there. And I think that, that what I hear everybody saying is that we need to actively look for and engage people from a wide variety of, of I mean, diversity means it's, difference is just, it just is, right? Our, like, it's not something that we need to manage or cultivate, like, it just is. But we need to reflect that and we need to understand that it's beneficial to all of us and not expect the young woman to know all about every young woman's issue, right? That, that this is, we bring our own perspectives and, but the more, the greater that we are reflecting our communities, the more likely we are to actually make the decisions that are good for the, the greater diversity. Thank you for those comments, Rhonda. And my clock up here is wrong. It's actually just about time for a break. So 
that'll be our last comments, but I'm sure our panelists will stay here to answer your questions at the mic. Sorry guys, it always happens at the end of everybody starts thinking. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here. It was a great discussion. Um, our break is coming up and it's sponsored by Clifton's and the FCM address is next in the ballroom. So have a great morning everybody. Thank you.